How often have you turned on the television and heard the host say something like this? Tonight, we're gonna to be talking about faith versus science. Our first guest is an Oxford professor, Richard Dawkins, and he's smart and he's representing science. And our second guest representing faith is Joe. Joe lives in a swamp and thinks Oprah's the Antichrist. And we go, when I go, this is really what, this is the representative of my faith. I don't get it. But this is a popular narrative. It pits faith against science. And we want to talk about it. We want to recognize that that whole thing is a false dichotomy. It's a lie. It's, it's a widely held opinion for sure. And the idea is science moves us forward. It deals with objective evidence that leads all of us forward. Well, faith looks back to ancient teachings, outmoded holy books and irrational conclusions in the face of overwhelming evidence against it. And it just holds on because it wants to believe in God or whatever. This is sold to us over and over again, but, but it's nothing more than a cultural myth written and preached by one of the most pervasive, powerful structures of thought the world has ever seen, secularism. Secularism is, is basically a worldview that seeks to eliminate God from society as a whole, from science, law, education, the arts. And it tries to argue that there is nothing beyond what we can experience with our senses. Uh, it's also called naturalism. And so it asserts that anyone who doesn't trust in purely naturalistic, atheistic answers to the questions of our lives is primitive and irrational. Some go as far to say that people of faith are, are, are naive and they're even insane. Richard Dawkins has actually said, faith is like a mental illness, a great cop-out, the excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Sam Harris, one of the most unspoken voices in the new atheism movement agrees and he says, we have names for people who have many beliefs for which there is no rational justification. When their beliefs are extremely common, we call them religious. Otherwise, they are likely to be called mad, delusional, or psychotic. Notice the dichotomy. Science is about thinking and evidence and rational justification and Christianity and faith is about evading evidence. It's about clinging to non-rationality. But what if secularism and naturalism are actually the views that are outdated? What if those are the views that are still spreading 17th, 18th century ideas? What if the worlds of faith and reason are not opposed to each other at all? but actually belong together in a beautiful and life-changing symmetry that makes sense of the evidence even more than atheistic explanations do. That's precisely what I have come to see. After years of examination, I have been led toward Christianity, toward faith in Jesus because of reason, because of science, because of history, because of philosophy, because of psychology, and away from a modernistic, secular, atheistic, naturalistic worldview. Not because Christianity is less rational, that it's some spiritual thing over here versus real or logical, but because it's actually more rational. It's happening to millions of people worldwide. And I came to believe in Christianity because I actually explored the, the philosophy and the history and the archaeology and came to realize that it's actually more rational to believe in Christianity and God himself than to not. And this move toward rational faith is actually happening to millions and millions of people around the world. The field of philosophy, for instance, is actually being desecularized. They say that one quarter to one third of university philosophy departments across the United States now consists of theists, basically people who believe in God or even Christians. One writer has said this, that he is convinced that the case for belief in God is inductively so much stronger than the case for unbelief that true philosophical atheism must be regarded as a superstition. Now, why is that the case? Well, there's a guy named uh, David Lindbergh and he's a historian and he talks about the medieval era. And he talks about the idea that, you know, this myth that we kind of people of faith were uh, persecuting people, persecuted by science. And then people of faith pushed against science and said, we don't want to believe in any kind of scientific conclusions. And so there was always kind of this push and pull. And uh, Hinberg says this, there was no warfare between science and the church. The reality is the church did not persecute Copernicus or Bruno or Galileo for scientific theories. They did persecute those guys. But he says, uh, yes, they got persecuted, but it wasn't for scientific theories. In fact, all of that is mythology. Uh, the scholar Alistair McGrath says this, 
The idea that science and religion are in perpetual conflict is no longer taken seriously by any major historian of science. One of the last remaining bastions of atheism survives only at the popular level, namely the myth that an atheistic fact-based science is permanently at war with a faith-based religion. Historians of science actually basically recognize that the thing we call the modern scientific world was actually conceived and born out of Christianity. It was the matrix of Christianity that actually gave birth to the modern scientific endeavor. The popular picture of Christians being scared of science and deep thinking and reason has simply never actually been the case. The university is a 12th century Christian invention. Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Northwestern, all of these began as Christian institutions. So we've got to understand that all of that idea of faith versus science is mythology. The other myth that we've got to understand is that every single person, whether they're an atheist or a naturalist, or they say they just believe in pure science, every single person has a faith position in some way. I have a friend who's a nurse at a hospital, and she talks about how they have to make decisions every day in the hospital, and they say that, you know, the hospital is a secular place, that nothing we do can be driven by any kind of religious ideology at all. And they had to make a decision, and at one point they had pulled the plug on this particular patient, and they were all sitting around later and talking about it. And one of the doctors said, you know, at least the person's not suffering anymore. And she realized in that moment that that was a faith position. That's actually a statement about metaphysics, uh, the afterlife, because they don't have any evidence that this person's not suffering anymore. In fact, they could be suffering more than they were. They don't know that. But when we make statements like that, we're showing our hand. We're saying we actually have positions about what happens to a soul after they die when we really don't have any evidence from the afterlife to prove that position. See, every single one of you, whether you're a believer in Jesus or not, has a faith position. Uh, there was this uh, university professor at Harvard. He was a biologist, and he kind of admitted this in one of the papers that he wrote. He said, um, I have, and naturalism and science has, a prior commitment to materialism. He says, it's not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world. On the contrary, he said, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes. We cannot allow a divine foot in the door. What he's basically saying is, hey, what drives science is not necessarily just facts, but philosophy. We've already decided that we can't allow God in the door to explain anything that we see in the world. We begin with that assumption and we move forward from there. But the thing that you've got to understand is that's a faith position. See, you cannot doubt unprovable Christian belief A, except from a position of faith in unprovable non-Christian belief B. Take, for example, if you're a skeptic and you don't believe in the resurrection from the dead, why don't you believe Jesus rose from the dead? Because you already start out with an assumption that when people died, they never come back from the dead. But in a sense, that's a faith position. See, every one of us has it at all times. One of the classic dichotomies between science and religion is the debate about evolution. And one of the difficulties, of course, for evolutionary thinkers, for naturalistic evolutionary thinkers that take God out of the equation is the big questions, and this is what the faith community has always said, is you're not really answering the question of where did the origins of species actually come from in the sense of there had to be a first cause, there had to be something that begins this long process of millions of years of evolutionary development. And there's also been moralistic questions that have arisen. Um, one, of, one of the arguments of, of a naturalistic thinker is everything we believe has been wired into our brains through millions of years of decisions. And that's why we believe this and believe that. And the, the person of faith pushes back and begins to say, well, what about all the things that we believe that aren't best explained through we're just animals that have developed over millions of years? What about all of the decisions and moralistic ideas that we have? Explanations for life and origins that take God out of the equation. Uh, they've been challenged continuously when they try to explain where and why certain cognitive ideas originated in human beings. So what I mean is, where did the idea, for instance, of God come from? Or even atheism itself. How did creatures like you and I, with evolved physical and cognitive capabilities like contemporary humans, come to ever create the 
vast body of scientific knowledge that now exists, including evolutionary theory itself. We use our brains, of course, our cognitive faculties, our rational thoughts. The weakness in the evolutionary theory is that if that theory is true, everything, including our minds and what we think, requires a naturalistic evolutionary explanation. And therein lies the problem. Charles Darwin actually himself said this. He feared this idea and he wrote hauntingly, said, within me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of a man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of lower animals, is of any value or at all trustworthy. See, the problem is Darwin's theory itself was a conviction of a man's mind. So the question is, why should it be trustworthy? Does the theory of naturalistic evolution and the way we think actually eat itself? Because everything you actually think about is a construct of that theory, including the theory itself. And thus you can't trust that theory. It's kind of like being in the matrix and you can't get out of it. It arises all kinds of questions about why is it that we don't think like animals? At what point did humankind actually, like when a lion kills a zebra, it kills a zebra, but it doesn't murder the zebra. When a great white shark uh, forcibly copulates, as one writer has said, with a female shark, we don't call it rape. We just go, that's what sharks do because there's no moral dimension to these actions. They're animals. So it's justified for us to ask why did we, as human beings, ever develop the moralistic structures that counter the violent realities of nature? One of the things we got to understand is 60, 70 years ago, everyone thought that as science delved deeper into whatever discipline it happened to be looking into, that there'd be more reason not to believe in God, that atheism would just rise out of our scientific endeavor and we would put away this idea of God and faith and all these things. That's why if you look at Star Trek, Star Trek in the 1960s, of course, a vision of the future. And as they go around, go to all their planets, there's no spirituality. There's no religion because the assumption was as technology and science move forward, religion would be done. But if you look at Star Trek made in the 1990s, the next generation, there's religious people all over the place. There's actually religious people on the enterprise. Spirituality is a big deal. Why? There was a shift. I, we began to realize that the deeper science delved into the world, whether it was biology or astronomy or uh, physics, we began to realize there's actually evidence rising out of these things for the existence of God, not against the existence of God. This is why uh, Stephen Jay Gould, who's one of the most celebrated uh, naturalistic, atheistic, Darwinian thinkers in the world, actually said, he wrote a paper years ago where he said, I want to tell my colleagues for the umpteenth millionth time that we can't adjudicate the question of God's existence from the world of physics, from the world of science. He said, he, he coined a phrase that it's a NOMA principle, he called it, non-overlapping magisteria, that science by itself actually can't answer the question of God because God transcends the things science looks at. And that's the kind of humble state science has to take when it's trying to deal with the question of God. But we have to understand as people of faith, that science actually points to the existence of God and, and we're not supposed to run away from it. Christianity has always leaned in. Romans 1 tells us that Paul goes, God's invisible attributes have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. And so what it's trying to tell us is we're supposed to lean into the scientific endeavor, see the things God has made, and then start to deduce things about God's very existence. See, Christianity has never run from science. It's actually leaned into science and said, when we're discovering things about the universe, things about the stars, things about DNA, as we're gonna talk about, the reality is they constantly point toward God, not away from God. And so we need to be people of faith, and science, we need to run the ramp of reason before taking the leap of faith and be people who actually inform our faith positions with the evidence of the world that God has given us.